Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Rahul Verma. I work here at the Center for Policy Research. And this is for those of you who have been with us on this journey to understand Indian elections since last August. Uh, this is the 15th iteration of how India votes. Uh, and since uh, I think elections are going to be announced in uh, next few weeks, perhaps early March, like last time, I thought it's a good idea to bring in some people who have been working as political strategists and uh, consultants, but also uh, academics who have been studying this new emerging field of political consultancy and uh, election strategists in India. Uh, we are joined by a very esteemed set of uh, panelists. Uh, let me introduce uh, uh, them to you. Uh, Amok Sharma, uh, he's a lecturer at the University of Oxford. And I'm eagerly waiting for Amok's uh, book, which is based on his doctoral dissertation, which actually looks at the evolution of political consultancy and election strategist in India. And I would expect Amok to perhaps give us a, a snapshot of the evolution of this industry in the country. Uh, then we have uh, Professor Ajit Fadnis. Uh, he teaches at uh, Indian Institute of Management at uh, Indore. Uh, and Ajit has written a very interesting paper for those of you who have not read. I'll, uh, during the conversation, I'll try to uh, send a link of that paper. Ajit did a sort of like mapping of this industry uh, and asked five set of interesting questions who these uh, consultants are, what they do, uh, what kind of services they provide, and what might the future of this industry look like and what kind of uh, challenges uh, they face. Uh, we also have with uh, uh, Rimjim Gaur, uh, she's founder of CPN Research and Analysis. Uh, Rimjim, at the moment, uh, she just told us, is in Delhi and setting a war, war room for a political party, and she can talk about what that war room is going to do. Uh, but in the past few years, Rimjim has been actively working with many uh, uh, candidates on the ground and helping uh, uh, them, you know, mobilize voters. And so whether strategists can win elections or not, and what kind of services they provide, I think Jim Jim can provide us with a snapshot. And my fourth guest, uh, he's busy in a meeting with the core committee members of a party. Uh, so he said he'll join us uh, shortly. Uh, Amitabh Tiwari is a election strategist, uh, also works in the financial sector. Uh, Amitabh, my, like I, I have given him a brief that uh, since he's working very closely with a political party at the moment, what kind of expectations do politicians and parties have from these uh, consultants and strategies? What are the demands that are uh, made on them? So without any delay, uh, I will start with Amok. But uh, before Amok jumps in, I would request everyone, if you have questions or comments, uh, please start putting them on Q&A box. Uh, 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 one, these panelists can answer some of them uh, 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 while when they are not speaking. But in the second round, I can weave in your questions uh, 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 while asking them. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, Amok, uh, let me bring you in. Uh, thank you for joining us. Today. All right. Um, I just want to start by firstly thanking Rahul and the entire CPR team for uh, this very kind invitation. And there's, before um, I come and talk, say, say a few words about the evolution of the industry and its origin, I just want to say one thing that I think it's wonderful that organizations such as CPR have existed. And I think this, the assault that they've faced in the last few weeks and months, close to a year now, I think it's absolutely reprehensible. And I think, you know, there's no point talking about elections if we don't understand that who we vote for will have very serious impact on whether organizations such as CPR can continue to exist. So I do want to say that in my personal capacity. Thank you. Um, so maybe just let me just take a five minutes to give a sense of how I think the industry starts and maybe set the tone for the conversation. There's a lot more I think I can learn from my co-panelist. And I want to start by doing something that I, is a very annoying thing that I think academics do, which is harp on definitional issues. So, you know, the term strategist is thrown around. One can use the term political professional, a lot of other competing terms. So maybe for the sense of analytical clarity, I'll explain how I like to approach these terms. We can use the term strategist or, or a political professional too for a wide range of people. But I think it's worth making two distinctions. The first of which is that I think we need to consider in-house specialists, people who are tied to parties on a fairly permanent basis, uh, people who I like to call party employees because they perform discrete strategic tasks, but they're tied to a certain party for a relatively long period. And on, on the other hand, we have someone, some people call political consulting firms, right? These are people who likely will move between candidates 
will move between different parties from election to election. They don't have the same sense of stability uh, that associates them to election campaigns. And I think the term strategist is a catch-all term for both categories, but I think it's worth making a distinction because both kind of actors have a different origin story in Indian politics. I think if you want to look at strategists in the sense of political consulting firms, you know, they have a prehistory that can go as far as one would like. You know, one can say that the contemporary Prashant Kishores of the world, their prehistory can be perhaps tied back to the rise of political advertising firms. So, you know, if one has to talk about when was the first time that political advertising and reliance on spin doctors became popular in popular in Indian politics, I mean, one can go all the way back to the 1960s when Swatantata Party hired the services of a famous Bombay ad man whose name some of you might be familiar with, Karsi Katrak. And they designed what were at that time one of the most uh, prominent newspaper broadsheet advertisements in the 60s for the Swatantara Party. Uh, then, of course, the Big Bang movement, and I talk about this in my forthcoming book, for political advertising in India takes place in the 1980s. In the 1984 general election, when the Congress Party hires the services of Rediffusion Private Limited, uh, who was at the, at the time the managing director of Rediffusion, which becomes Red F, the popular internet website of the 90s, which is still in existence. And 80s is then the Big Bang movement. And then, of course, there's an evolution of further strategic inputs in the sense of pollsters coming in. We have Pranoy Roy and his colleagues who popularized apology. So that's when strategists in the sense of opinion polling firms become popular in the Indian landscape. And then, then I think it's the 2000s period when we first start hearing the term political consultant, political strategist in this very formal designation of a character. 2014 is often associated as the big moment when Prashant Kishore emerges on the field, his, his organization becomes the focal point and the example of a political consulting firm par excellence. But in my own research, I found that political consulting firms, people who self-identify with that label, predate um, Prashant Kishore by at least a decade, right? Amitabhji will come and of course he can tell us more. He's been working with these individuals for much longer than I think we have been familiar with them, right? So, um, you know, if, if you are someone like me who sort of re, who sort of achieved political maturity in the 90s, I remember picking up the telephone at home and uh, hearing this pre-recorded message, Metal Vary Vajpayee Bol Rao, in the late 90s election. That was, you know, those were the set of technologies and strategic inputs that parties initially turned to, or to these external vendors. That's when strategic inputs really become serious. And one of the first political consulting firms which I profile in my book is a man called Pallav Pandey, who starts an organization called Viplav. And he starts this service called Supercaller, which had this facility that could make pre-recorded phone calls to uh, a database of numbers and reach out to a large number of, uh, of people that, you know, Atal Gary Vajpayee used that in the late 90s. Another, another prominent client that Viplav uh, and Pallav Pandey turned to uh, was, um, uh, was, a, was an Urissa. Um, so I will not say a bit more on that, but I just want to give a sense that there is a long genealogy that one can trace when one wants to look at the roots of this industry. It has somehow started in pits and starts, and it's 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 a it's a messy trajectory, and there was nothing inevitable that these strategic strategists came to assume the power that they did. In the time that I have, and I do want to pass it on to Ajit and and Rinjim and others, I will I want to talk about three trends that I think have um, identified this uh, industry in the time that it has existed. The first trend worth thinking about is how the industry is moving between or be, between being characterized by generalists versus specialists. Generalists are people who provide a whole range of services that politicians might need under the same roof. So Prasant Kishore and IPAC are a perfect example. They can provide services from social media management, war room coordination, polling, what have you. The others who have very core competencies, they'll only do, let's say, pre-recorded IVR phone calls, or they'll provide you really granular insights of polling data. And in developing in, in developed parts of the world, the trend has been that the industry of political specialists has moved from being generalist to specialist. In India, what I find interesting is that actually it's moved from specialist in a certain sense to generalist. You know, initially there were famous admin, there were famous pollsters, and then we have these conglomerate organizations which are dominating the field. Not to say that there are no specialists, but I think the trend is quite interesting to map uh, in India versus other developed countries. The second trend which I talked about in the previous CPR panel, so I'll mention that very briefly, is political partisanship. In the West, again, we see when strategists, they tend to strongly identify with certain parties They don't cross party lines. Even United States, uh, a place as prominent in the United States, you won't find 
famous political consultants working with the Democrat in one election cycle or with the Republican the next. That's again a trend we don't see in Indian politics. We see a lot, prom a lot of prominent political consulting firms will happily switch affiliations and will work for candidates who belong to different ends of the political spectrum. And the third trend that I want to talk about is what is happening to in-house specialists, what I call party employees, employees versus external vendors, which is the domain of political consulting firms. It seems to me that there is, we are reaching a sort of point of equilibria. It's not that one is crowding out the other. I think most parties have created in-house competencies. They have social media sales. They have research departments. Uh, but also, I think at the individual politician level is where the demand for political consultants are political consultants are coming in. There, are, there is still the odd example where a whole party will, let's say, seek the services of an IPAC. That does happen, but the majority of the demand in this industry is coming from the level of individual politicians who hire it in their in their particular local constituency. So I think Raul, I've used yeah, up. Uh, thank you, Amog. And I think you have uh, stopped at the right uh, point from where Ajit can uh, pick up what is the state of industry uh, at the present, where the demand is maximum, and what the future of this industry is going to look like. Some of these things, Ajit, for you. Yeah, thank you, Rahul. Thanks uh, for inviting me and uh, uh, welcome to the co panelist. Uh, thanks for a book. Thanks to a book to give this, uh, you know, uh, very uh, crisp overview of what it is. And that, of course, enables me to continue the conversation further. Uh, I want to bring a slightly uh, different viewpoint from what Amok has brought in, which will, of course, give a, uh, uh, you know, new flavor to the discussions on uh, political consultants. So, of course, as Amu pointed out, that political consultants can be looked at as, uh, you know, you can call them political advisors. Some people may call them political coach. Some people may, may call them political consultants. But I see that, you know, this domain can be broadly divided into two. So, one are the political, uh, uh, you know, advisors. And these are people who, you know, come into parties to advise parties on strategy and things like that. And the value that these strategies bring is that they bring an independent point of view, right, which is valued by parties. A lot of times these uh, independent viewpoints are valued because they seem to be a little bit more data driven and conducted through surveys and things like that. So that broadly falls into the realm of, of uh, political advisors. The second uh, idea of consultants is those that give logistical kind of help to parties. It's more like, you know, a concept of public-private partnership, right? Where a government ties up with a, with a private organization. I mean, if you're looking at a typical example is, you know, the recently developed uh, sea line, the Atul Setu, right? So it was a government that, uh, it was a public that decided the project and it was a private that executed it and the public, but the responsibility still uh, lies with the public. So there are lots of services that, uh, you know, parties also give private vendors to do and some of them have been uh, well described by a mob, right? And uh, uh, so, so uh, some of them would include, for example, social media management, uh, you know, voter surveys, then uh, booth management, things that parties feel that, you know, they need a little bit more of management. Uh, you know. So I want to highlight these two because political advisory has been there from time eternal, right? So if you go back to Vidur in the Mahabharat, right, he was a political advisor, right? And of course, we have not had not so good political advisors as well in the form of Shakur. Right. And of course, in the West as well, we had, uh, you know, Machiavelli. And so, so, so political advisory uh, it seems to be a, in a different realm. Of course, there are some firms which do both. Right. And, and something that Amok pointed out is that, you know, firms like IPAC do a mix of a, a whole lot of services, while some firms focus on the specialized services that don't get into the general. Just to give you a broad uh, sense of what, uh, you know, uh, if if you're looking at the size of the industry, the easier way to look at it is in terms of the number of seats, right? So if you're if you say that there are roughly around four thousand odd uh, MLA seats in India, and about five forty Lok Sabha seats in India, so you're basically having a a, a thumb rule of uh, a a broad uh, number of about four thousand five hundred seats, 
And if you're looking at, uh, you know, individual projects, there are roughly about 20 to uh, 30 lakh uh, at the constituency level, right, for the assembly elections. And if you're looking at the Lok Sabha elections, they would be much higher, right, probably in, in uh, higher up in 50 to 60 lakhs. If you take a rough estimate of that, you're looking at an industry of about 1,500 to 2,004, which is a very, very conservative estimate. Yeah, so this is a huge kind of uh, space that uh, that is there uh, to kind of uh, move around. And as uh, uh, Amuk said, I don't want to reply uh, to repeat some of his points. Of course, uh, political some consultants, some who work at the individual level, right, tend to be uh, less uh, unaligned. But some people who work at the party levels tend to be more clearly aligned. And examples, for example, uh, consultancy firms which are uh, aligned at the party level. Varahi uh, and, uh, you know, Nation for Namo with, re with regard to the BJP, with regard to Congress, it is the inclusive minds. Then, of course, they are, uh, IPAC also for a long time seemed to work across parties. But now I think we are seeing some kind of a, a movement uh, towards working towards parties who uh, contest against the BJP. So in some sense, they are showing a political alignment. Then the Showtime Consulting, which works the regional parts. So, uh, so I, I just want to, uh, you know, uh, uh, stop at this. And of course, we can get uh, reactions from other panelists and continue the discussion. Thank, uh, you. thank you. Thank you, Ajit. Let me now bring in Rimjim. Uh, Rimjim, I have two sort of like uh, tasks for you. One, since you are, uh, you know, uh, one of the strategists and consultant and have been in the field, uh, uh, for our benefit, can you tell us like this academic uh, uh, sort of reading which Ajit and Amok provided, how closer it is to the reality and how uh, far it is, since we academics get of uh, all the time beaten that, you know, real world is something else and you guys talk uh, uh, something else. Uh, second, uh, you know, from your own sort of like experience as you have worked, uh, what kind of services do politicians and parties expect? And I believe that uh, of late, you have been working with a political party, not with candidates. How are these two domains uh, differ uh, in terms of expectations? Sure, Rahul. First of all, thanks for having me over. Indeed, thanks for having a very pertinent topic, which is very close to my heart. Because whenever we sit for a 10 p.m. conversation, this is exactly what we bring up. Are we really making a change? Or are we like just like, you know, really, you know, kind of swelling with this ego that, okay, we are doing something. So I'm glad to discuss this today. Uh, first of all, uh, as Ajit Ji and Amok said, uh, broadly, I completely agree with what they said. However, I'll start with the first point made by Amok because uh, from there we can kind of expand this. So uh, as he rightly said, there are generalists and there are people who specialize in certain kind of services. However, other than a few powerhouses like IPAC or Showtime Consulting, most of the people right now who are not working with candidates are the specialists. So let's first talk about people who work with candidates because their range of services is very different from people who work with the party. Uh, so uh, when we talk about candidates and uh, I think uh, the magnitude uh, of opportunity and the market availability, Ajit Ji has already pointed out about it. So uh, the work starts with surveying, of course. Uh, surveying can have multiple dimensions to it. You could do a field survey. That could be a focus group discussion. You could have a call center because, uh, you know, there's a very, lim very limited reach when we talk about field surveys. And there could be like a lot of data that could be bought in. By the way, data has a very interesting point to it because it's very, very, very difficult to get data from the government if uh, your candidate does not hail from the party, which is ruling in the center or in the state. So again, that's like a different conversation that we need to have for the other. So I what say. kind of data you uh, want just uh, for the sake of? Uh... There could be a data of, you know, for example, say a certain kind of professionals, there could be a data of beneficiaries, there could be data of self-help groups. So these are the data that you would want to tap in, right, while you're hmm. working at some of the data basically uh, is not with you. For example, if you're working with a central party, and this hmm. is data it gets very difficult to catch hold of data even if you are ruling in the center leave alone for the parties which are not but there's so, no data there's no data. for example census so uh, you know how do we then work with it 
Exactly. So once you are done with that line of work, which is like data analysis of retrospective, kind of reaching out to these people, hitting the ground, you come up with your, of course, conclusions, and then you start talking about strategy. Once the strategy time is there, of course, then you start aligning your data booth wise, you start talking about which are like, you know, your strongholds, which are your weak holes, you kind of divide them demographically, and then your entire, I would say, campaigning or outreach, which we just talked about the IVRS by um, Atal Vihari Vajpayee, you just mentioned. In fact, these days we have more of AI generated uh, data and uh, i still remember because we were uh, experimenting with this so we um uh, there are vendors who just make it for you so for example if you are talking and uh, they'll just take your voice from this conversation and they'll just mend it according to my voice ki, okay uh, namaste rimjim ji aap jo hai is part se baat kar rahi hai, or this is me talking so th these are the things that they keep basically experimenting with but i don't think so it has still reached a level where individual candidates or clients are utilizing it just given how expensive it is at this point so uh, after that's done after the campaign starts uh I, I would say uh, a lot of logistical uh, uh, responsibilities are with these people who deal with individual clients. And after that, uh, once that's done, they are uh, usually just uh, kind of talking to uh, the organization to make sure that the final day mobilization and other things that happen on the second last day of the elections, which shall not be talked about or mm. named. Mm. However, when we talk about candidates or uh, political, I would say, consultants who work with party. It's a very different story because you are working in an organizational capacity. So you start with working with the top leadership of the party. For example, you are talking, you are uh, kind of, uh, you have a certain weightage in the involvement of, uh, in, uh, in conversations towards who shall get ticket from where. And at the same time, you are sitting at the table where you can have discussions about what do we need to do next, exactly what uh, the advisory was. Mm -hmm. Why? Towards the end of the, I would say, elections, you move more into a role where you are uh, assisting the organization of the party more than the top leadership. Mm -hmm. So the role differs very, very drastically for both people and both kind of, uh, uh, I would say, um, set of political consultants. And uh, that's how it works. And as you said, uh, uh, I, I think one of you just pointed this point. Just just give me one second. Someone's like, I'm getting I think Rimjim's point about data was super fascinating to me. I'll have more to say on that later, but that's super interesting for me to hear. I'm really sorry, there was a call. No. So as we just talked about that, a lot of work is outsourced rather than in-house. That's very true. So even if someone says that we are like generalist and uh, we are doing everything, in fact, most of the times, uh, the reality is that we end up uh, collaborating between each other among ourselves. And even if we say that we do 360 degree, it's just like we are just outsourcing work to each other. So no one actually does 360 degree. It's just like, you know, sounds fascinating to offer an umbrella of uh, things and then kind of, you know, keep outsourcing it. Yeah. But this also might be because, uh, you know, political consultancy as a as an industry is still growing, is in nascent stages in that sense, right? And so... Uh, it's hard to maintain the entire 360 degree staff. Uh, and so at the moment, this must be much like slowly, uh, uh, if your organizations like your get bigger, of course, you would like to have uh, more of these facilities at your uh, end rather than outsourcing them, or you would still prefer outsourcing. Uh, I think it has two aspects to it. So, for example, if I'm working with one political party completely, then I might would want to hire an in-house specialization. Reason mm -hmm. I know that my uh, my projects are going to be longer. And even mm -hmm. if this one specific project is over, I uh, will be able to sustain my entire team because I'll have a series of projects coming, you know, my way later on. However, people who are uh, dependent upon one election, it's very difficult, you know, it, it it's actually heartbreaking to train people and then, you know, the brain drain is going to happen for sure. So mm -hmm. it 
depends in which capacity I'm working. If I'm working with a party and I'm sticking to a certain, I would say, group of organization, I would definitely love to cultivate that in-house. Also, mm. the most parties have their in-house capacities and one would be de dealing with data, the other would be dealing with logistical, there would be people like us who will be dealing with mobilization. So it's easy to collaborate. So I don't have to kind of repeat what the other organization is already doing in-house. It's mm. easy to within among ourselves rather than kinds of outsourcing so let me ask you one more question and then i'll move to amitab uh, uh, since you have very carefully chosen what to say not and what not to say uh, uh, which is like do you think uh, uh, like are there political parties who have all kinds of in-house facilities and are there political parties who have nothing like it seems as if you guys are suggesting that most parties in india uh, are employing and they have uh, all facilities. Uh, uh, is is that true for all big parties or you would say uh, only some parties have this uh, uh, sort of facility? So uh, a great example uh, to answer your question, we can ju just look at IPAC. When mm. IPAC, they had multiple clients. Mm. At this, the kind of pool, the pool they are looking at is very restricted and limited. Reason mm party has focused and understood that it's better to keep the data in-house. It's better to have our people who are like more loyal to us and mm -hmm. kind of activate our own strength. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yes, most of the parties are doing that. However, that does not mean that there's no space. Uh, I mean, for people who are not in-house, you mm -hmm. can always something, you can always find something that party is not delivering. Mm -hmm. and, for example, if you talk about the national parties, they always have need for agencies when it comes to states because mm. they need some specialization with respect to regional, I would say, capacity or with respect to the logistical uh, contacts you have there. In fact, call centers, even if you are setting up call centers, it's a very different ball game to set one in Tamil Nadu while to set the, another in West Bengal. Mm -hmm. so, Yes, yes, there is space for people who work. However, yes, uh, most of the political parties have chosen to uh, put the same money in-house because it gives them a certain sense of, uh, I would say, stability. Secondly, mm. have more, uh, I would say, agency on your own data center rather than having to depend on someone who might just go to some other party and right. that's difficult. Yeah. Thank you, uh, uh, Rimjim. Uh, Amitabh, if I can bring you in, uh, and if you're free from your court committee meeting, uh, can you hear me, Amitabh? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, so uh, I have uh, two, three questions for you. One is, uh, uh, are there some kind of politicians and parties who are more amenable to uh, political consultancy work? And, and the reason I'm asking this question, like long back, uh, I, I used to hear from uh, different people that if you approach a politician, and especially those who are like in 50s and 60s, they would treat you, you are a 20 year kid, like what would you teach me about politics? Or what can you tell me about my own constituency that I don't know? Uh, so are there some uh, like, and, and I don't want this in just in terms of age that younger politicians are more amenable to it, but like, are there some like Northern uh, politicians versus Southern politicians? those who have gone out to study versus those who have stayed here, uh, you know, uh, uh, people who come from political families who have seen politics for long or versus newcomers, wealthy versus... Uh, like, are there some kind of politicians and parties who are more amenable to uh, political consultancy work? And what kind of things they expect uh, uh, you to uh, do? And is there a kind of timeline that you say, now, sir, only two months are left, only this can be done? Uh, had you told us a year back, we could have done a survey and designed those kind of... So when does this work usually, like, in an ideal scenario starts? See, it all depends upon the vision of the leader. Okay. Normally, normally most parties start work three to six months before elections. Hmm. But uh, I was doing a project in 2019, just after the simultaneous elections a party lost election and we set up a team in 2019 october mm. and the elections are now in uh, april may so it, mm. it all depends upon uh, the priorities and the vision of the leader and how well they see an outsider mm. when i say political consultant advisory whatever you call it strategy mm. how 
how how dire is the need of a strategist see see the most important thing which which a political advisor strategist consultant does is is that that company or that individual is providing a third party neutral feedback to the client hmm most of the times that is not available to political parties most of the times hmm. most of the times it is not available to leaders hmm. because there is a coterie who may do not want the leader to hmm. Hmm. know the right thing or the true hmm. have hmm. the true insights hmm. so most of the times wherein i have worked it is largely a validation of what they already know as you said okay they know a lot of things correct because they have been fighting elections for 30 years 50 years 20 years whatever hmm. but they want to test what they know whether it is right or wrong that is one hmm. of the primary i would say responsibilities hmm then of course they also need third party view on strategy and strategy is largely common sense hmm. it looks like a very complex word but hmm. it is largely common sense because there is no course for political consulting or i am hmm. i have not come across i mean even if there is i don't know i mean what what value addition is there so it's largely common sense correct so hmm. when you say strategy strategy is largely i mean for example whether a regional party should form an alliance with a national party hmm. what could be the gains what could be the losses what could be the short term gain versus long term pain it etc mm-hmm. so and when we talk about individuals i largely have not worked with a lot of individuals so individuals like uh, sir was saying is that there are some 4 5 400 4000 or 4500 odd odd mlas mm-hmm. and then there are let's say 1000 odd mps mm-hmm. and uh, this could translate into a significant big business however most of the people i mean you can just do not have any political consultant at their disposal hmm hmm most hmm. of the people i would say it will be largely 500 to 1000 hmm. in my opinion hmm. that is because what happens is that whoever is slightly educated hmm. in their coterie has become a an unofficial advisor of sorts hmm and these are the guys who i would say are a threat to this industry in india because it is largely fragmented anyways correct because hmm. even today the top players who you name do not have significant work hmm because most of the parties now i mean most of the parties when i say the big parties hmm who have big funds to spend during lok sabha elections which is bjp congress have largely moved to a kpo sort of uh, a formation correct wherein mm. they have their abms and varahis and the inclusive minds etc mm. so uh, mostly these individuals have have started work or giving advice to politicians mm. and since they have a stake or an interest Hmm. that stake or an interest may be political they want some work done in their constituency or they have some ambition to to get some position in the party they are doing it largely pro bono hmm so when you go to an mla candidate today and explain your services and you want a 20 30 lakh per month billing hmm. hmm that is very difficult in in today's scenario i mean out of 4000 maybe 500000 people could afford that kind of money or do or do see value value in in this in this entire exercise hmm. in hmm. terms of clients now regional parties today after uh you can say this bipolarization hmm at national level as well as this bipolarization and at this... state level the regional parties are now increasingly amenable or mm. seeking the help of political consultants or strategists mm. Mm. and work here is on a 360 degree basis so they need everything mm. either 
either you 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 start as a generalist and then outsource some of the activities to uh, some agencies hmm. or they hire people who could do bits and pieces hmm. so that is largely how the how I, I i see the industry and then of course we will move ahead as we discuss okay uh, thank you uh, amitabh uh, let me bring you back, uh, Amok, uh, and using some questions from uh, audience, and I'll request uh, people in audience, if you have questions or comments, just mention on Q&A box, and I'll try to weave in uh, while putting it to our panelists. So, uh, Amok, you were interested on, uh, uh, you know, uh, adding something to the data question. Uh, there are a couple of questions which is also related to do uh, uh, related to this, especially since you've spoken to many of strategists and consultants. Like one, how do they verify authenticity of uh, 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 any data, right? Uh, and uh, is like, or do politicians and parties have multiple uh, sources of uh, this information, right? So uh, it's not that the party which uh, uh, Rimjim is working with, they are only looking at what Rimjim is presenting. They are also getting Amitabh's viewpoint. So yes, uh, you know, a party with large, financial coffers can uh, afford multiple uh, 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 consultants, but a party with a smaller coffer or candidates might not be able to uh, attend this. And what kind of like, especially someone asked like, uh, is there uh, a market in this field? And especially for data scientists, what would you say to them? I mean, starting with the last one, there's a huge market and it's only going to increase. So, you know, if someone wants to get into it, you know, no movement like the present. Um, I'll answer the question, but you know, quickly you were asking Rim Jim about what sort of data they have. I will not betray the discretion of my of the people I do research with, so I won't mention the the province or the party. But it's shocking the depth and granularity of data you can have access to if the party who's hiring you is in power in that state. If that is there, because there are no data protection laws in India, worth speaking of, you can have anything from LPG connection data sets to pensioner to bank accounts. You, you can literally be transferring money into people's uh, bank accounts if you have, you know, who to target. You can create customized campaign messages for a widow if you have the pensioner's data set. Like, it's it's shocking, and I think it's it's easy to be cynical about it. I think it's a scandal just how abysmal data protection laws are here. Uh, you know, just as a simple example, in, in the UK, we have a law called the GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, which makes my life quite hard. So I can mark an essay of my student and I can't pass on that single mark to a colleague because that's protected data as per law. So, you know, just, it just it's world apart we're talking about. Hmm. On the question of authenticity, I think the there are multiple things worth saying here. One is, of course, they do have multiple data sources. Hmm. And one thing I quite found interesting is that I was following, a, I was following, I was doing research in a campaign war room back in 2022. And to decide who, who should be the chief ministerial candidate of this political party, there were three prominent names. Uh, they had hired different data sources. So they had a polling agency that they were doing it. They had war room coordinators who would call up daily, they would get daily inputs from their booth level officers. And then they had an IVR phone call in which you know they had a pre-recorded message and said, if you want candidate A, press one. If you want candidate B, press two and press three. Yeah. And by the end, the party got three different answers via the three different data sources. Yeah. So often it's not the absence of data. I find it funny that it's often an overabundance of data that makes decision-making hard, hard for political parties. So uh, the question is, I think, to my mind, when I've spoken to senior party leaders about this overabundance of data that makes their job hard, it's the fact that what's what they're doing is not using really data in a utilitarian sense, that they think there's one particular data source that is far more authentic, far more believable than others. But often they'll do this exercise of having multiple channels of data gathering simply as a way of also activating the party to get mm -hmm. the message down to the booth level that, look, the party is serious about this campaign. We want to make sure and we want you to be on high alert. And we want you to understand that we're taking this quite seriously. Mm -hmm. So right there are all these second order effects that this data-driven campaigning world produces. Not simply the, the sheer utility of what you get from the data, but you, you're sending signals to party workers also through uh, creating these vertical mechanisms. On affordability, uh, you know, it's a big question. Finance is a panel. I, I, I wish one day we can do a question, uh, we can do a panel on simply how the industry gets financed. Mm. But I'll say one thing, which is um, on the question of affordability, to my mind, it's interesting that some of the most 
innovative campaigns that has that have come up through political mm-hmm. strategies through the years, not just in the last decade, since the 80s, have been uh, spearheaded by people who were in opposition, who in some ways did not have access to state patronage, who could not move money from hither to there. Uh, so, you know, when I'm thinking of someone like in the 80s, you know, Ramakrishna Hegre quite famously hired Pranoy Roy and Titu Alivalia, who was mm-hmm. at Mark at that time. That's mm-hmm. the most prominent and first example in Indian politics of a opposition leader at that time, or of a non-hegemonic party at that time, taking the advice of a strategist on board like that, when Congress party was scoffing at cephalogist as having some special insight. Uh, we've seen that more recently um, in the last decade. So there are many examples of uh, that. I think more than affordability, I think what's at stake is when a political leader can take on the board of a, can take the advice of the strategist on board. Because a lot of times these folks get hired, but their, their opinions are not taken on board uh, in a meaningful sense. So far more than affordability, I think to my mind, it's a question of having that killer instinct to really follow through with whatever advice, whatever advice one mm-hmm. is getting. I okay. don't think affordability really becomes much of an option. As Nilanjan's work has shown there, politicians in India have such deep pockets increasingly. This is you know, loose change for most of them. Uh, uh, thank you, Amok. Uh, uh, Ajit, uh, I remember from your paper, uh, at least in one of the segments, you had talked about uh, the finance part of this political consultancy, which uh, Amok wanted to touch, but then, which is that, so one question uh, in your paper was, are we going to see foreign uh, companies who do political consultancy work coming into India if it's a huge market? Uh, uh, but you pointed out that uh, perhaps no, because most of the sort of like payments uh, in this market uh, and, and uh, you know, like I'm not uh, bringing my friends on the panel here, but uh, the idea is that sometimes the payments are not like uh, through checks and through bank transfers, but sometimes uh, it's through cash. And so that's why many foreign companies would not like to uh, come into this uh, 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 market. Uh, so one, uh, can you sort of like give us some insight into uh, like the finances uh, on uh, which this uh, market operates since you have spoken to uh, uh, many political consultants for your sure. paper. And second, yeah. uh, uh, just to sort of like uh, wear your political scientist hat, uh, and tell us a little bit about uh, the relationship between external consultants, internal consultants, and political party on the ground. Like, yeah. is it thanks. The, thanks. Very you... nice. Yeah, yeah. Two very interesting and very pertinent questions. Of course, the question of funding, you know, there would be two questions about that. One is, okay, where is the, uh, you know, funding going to come from? And the second is where the funding is uh uh, kind of going to. So if you're saying that political uh, political consultants are the clients and political parties are the ones who are, uh, you know, going to fund the political consultants, then, uh, uh, you know, there are whole lots of issues with that. One is, of course, that, you know, the election commission prescribes an expenditure limit. And so you can only disclose that much. And so political consultants, uh, you know, uh, putting a putting a particular uh, section on political consultants who then uh, put parties and candidate, particularly candidates, into trouble. So a lot of these may not happen very transparently, hmm. and so uh, so that's an issue. But there's also an issue about uh, credibility hmm. in terms of uh, you know, particularly when you're a, a small firm and hmm. you're uh, you know just uh, you know growing up the ranks. And but and you work with a prominent politician, and mm. the politician has lost the election, mm. right? So uh, sometimes it does happen that you don't get paid, mm. and so and so there is that aspect of credibility as well as the aspect of uh, you know the difficulty of disclosing that. Mm. Of course, as uh, as you rightly mentioned, that if you are a foreign, if you are a political uh, consultancy firm, uh, you know registered outside, mm. you have to disclose where. Uh, you know, your revenues come from. Mm. And that would be a huge uh, problem with, uh, you know, working with uh, uh, parties in India because they will not uh, be as ready to disclose it over here. So that's, of course, one issue. But the other issue, of course, that we talked to political consultants and they felt that the reason why, uh, for example, there are many political consultancy firms who uh, actively work in the U.S., 
they have expanded to Latin America and other parts of the world, right? But they have not found a foothold in India. Hmm. And one of the things is also to do with the uh, huge diversity in India, right? Where poli- where uh, where uh, you know con- where where conducting politics in Uttar Pradesh is very different from conducting politics in Andhra Pradesh, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so you need to know a different language. You need to have a different uh, cultural understanding. And so these are things that make it uh, particularly diff- difficult for uh, for for uh, firms, uh, you know, uh, to come in. But uh, that, given the the way it is, I mean, it's not that uh, you know firms who have established themselves in other countries have not. I mean, mm. uh, we still have we still have uh, you know uh, uh, firms which are in other businesses, for example, food businesses who have been managed to customize. Uh, uh, their food to the local uh, this thing so but there's a lot uh, there's a big learning curve with regard to okay. uh, uh, I just want to add one more point about the uh, funding hmm. and, and also I wanted to add something to uh, Amok's aspect please go ahead so the one thing that uh, in terms of innovative ideas that political consultants have come about is the idea of crowdsourcing of funding as well right so they are new uh, one of the consultants we spoke to talked about how they helped a particular party crowdsource funds from people so it's uh, so the, our usual perception is that political consultants will come in they will kind of uh, encourage uh, you know money to come from business and and so you know uh, uh, that's probably one part of the story but the other part of the story is that some innovations made by political consultants can also bring politics closer to the grassroots. And I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Ajit. Uh, Rimjim, I have a couple of questions for you. One, just picking up from uh, Ajit. Uh, so you are a, uh, you run a company. Would you like to, you know, go foreign in a sense, like, you know, the, in 2024, uh, half of the world is uh, having mm-hmm. elections. Like, do you have plans in future uh, to, uh, uh, you know, uh, strategize in uh, other countries. Uh, second, which is like uh, something that you said in your first uh, uh, opening remarks mm-hmm. is about uh, uh, like a constant question that you might have for yourself, which is, are we making a difference uh, to the society? Mm-hmm. Can you elaborate a little bit uh, on that, uh, especially because uh, some people would think that perhaps Political consultancy is another route of joining politics uh, for people like you, uh, uh, especially if politics is a very close business, uh, very few people get chance there. And so political consultancy is your route to enter party. You uh, show why uh, the party should uh, care about you or have you in its fold. Uh, so like in your interaction, do you find found like, uh, people who are in this business have some sort of like political ambition and many may follow Prasant Kishore route, uh, you know, launch a political party and campaign. Uh, is that, uh, what is your sense on these two things? So coming to your first question uh, about the plans going international. So we are already working on Indonesian elections, South African elections with a couple mm-hmm. of senators from the US. And we were kind of also involved in uh, very controversial in all these elections. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> so yes, I think there's always a chance, but again, uh, you have to see that how much of a foothold you can get over there. Coming to the question of how do uh, political consultants view our own uh, basically uh, contribution as? So I've met consultants who would say that we have made the government. And I would also meet people who would say, like, uh, we just did what we had to do. Like, uh, Mm. other than that, we couldn't do anything. However, uh, one thing that we have to understand is that every political party has two sides to it. One Mm. is the electoral set, Mm. which is people who are contesting elections. Other Mm. are the organizational people who are into advisory, who are basically regulating and activating the entire organization, who are working uh, basically on the booth levels, on the cluster of booths, on, I would say, assembly constituency levels, so on and so forth. Mm. If we view political consultants as, I would say, a support system to the latter, which is the organizational wing of the party, 
yes they do come as a very very integral part of it because not only do they bring like a lot of system or technology to it they are also able to regulate and uh, kind of uh, uh, delegate and manage the entire conversation execution so on and so forth that in a lot of parts they are not only organizing organizing campaigns strategizing campaigns organizing speeches of you know the final people writing speeches but they are also getting uh, you know the the entire crowd over there so if you see 2 lakh people there have been cases ki 2 ghante pehle there were just like 30000 people and then you know they were armed to a state and they got people ki chalo sab everyone get 50 50 people more the entire organization so that we can fill in the places so it mm. depends upon uh, what ex- exactly you are doing with which uh, rung of the party you are working at and i still won't say that it's political consultants uh, you know who make someone win or lose elections hmm. but again i can't say the same for a leadership as well or i hmm. can't say that for someone from organization either it's like hmm. an entire i would say concoction of people coming together and ensuring it happens like hmm. if you ask me really for any leader you know It, it could be you know any central leader modi ji rahul gandhi i would still say that a person who's on booth mm. he or she is doing a bigger job because at the last day on the day of election that person is the one who's getting like 50 or 100 people to get out and vote over there yeah, so yeah. it's all together a different question and in which capacity you work and uh, yes political consultants are just you know one of those people organizational and you know candidates coming to the question of the root like can people take the route of contesting elections via political consultancies yes i have seen cases where this has happened but again there's a very very practical challenge about it the people who have actually entered the party they have already created i would say multiple revenue streams because it would be a huge conflict of interest if you are getting money from your political consultant consultancy business and you want to enter the party it's like a direct conflict of interest right so um, after my personal experience in being in the field uh, if you really want to take that route of course it's great because so uh, it's just like being any other karyakarta of the party hmm. you get like literally a, the real hands on experience you get to be in touch with uh, the people uh, you are working with the top leadership but at the same time uh, of course you have to think of quitting your career as a i would say professional political consultant at some point if you hmm. really want to take the route of politics if you are uh, you know prepared for that if you are ready for that then why not i mean uh, so that that's exactly what i hear that if someone is a political consultant in fact i heard it from the top leadership of the party i work with right now that if you are a political consultant hmm. uh, then you actually compensated for not being in the students union and students union are very very important to the party i'm talking about so yes sure but be ready to kind of have your different sources of i would say revenue otherwise it's very difficult to yeah Okay. Uh, I would actually make a quick comment. Yeah, please, please. Uh, I think on the second point, that's very true, and that's something I find across the board in my research. A lot of people are attracted to this industry precisely because it's a different channel of participation. Mm. But I will say that this is where differences between parties really come in. I think these folks have a much easier time in a party like Congress to establish their foothold and then perhaps you know hanker for a ticket. BJP, that we have to say, is still far more disciplined. they will make you do the organizational work before they even consider you fielding as a candidate mm-hmm. you know there's a famous case of uh, pradyut bora was i think his name who was the mm-hmm. person who set up the it cells in mm-hmm. a lot of bjp states and he was eventually fielded as a candidate in an assam election mm-hmm. I, i'm forgetting which year it was but he really had to prove his mettle as an org- organizational man mm-hmm. before he could find that sort of space so yeah i just want to come in and make that point thank you amo uh amitabh i'm going to ask you a difficult question uh, difficult because i think uh, uh, it involves us uh, you opening us to a little bit uh, so you know like uh, a lot of time uh, and especially because i'm i'm picking some of the questions here uh, 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 there is a sort of a moral connotation to work of uh, uh, political consultancy right like people keep asking to lawyers also how can you defend a man who you think are guilty right so as a political consultant you might have faced situation where the party needs you to say certain things uh, uh, in 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 media or create a narrative in media which you think is false uh, uh, how, what do you do as a political consultant and and you don't have to like you know talk from your uh, personal experience but i'm i'm just asking because there are questions which is like uh, at the end of the day you are expected to make 
the or help the politician win the election. That's why you are in the business. And winning an election would require uh, building narratives, which is, of course, uh, uh, made up of some truths and some lies and some half lies. Uh, and uh, basically liaisoning with media, trying to create narratives and all kinds of those things. Uh, like, uh, is that like a difficult part of the job or you see that is just a job like lawyers uh, uh, defend their client, uh, whether the person is guilty or not. Uh, their job in the court is to defend the client, provide that service. So how do you like, are there ethical dilemmas that you uh, face or uh, no? Sorry for putting you through this. Silence is not the answer, or is it the answer, Amita? I'm so glad you asked this, by the way. I've been asking this question to my consultants all the time. Yeah. You are asking me, Rahul, sorry. Yes, sir. Yes, I think uh, you are most experienced among us and yeah. uh, in a better position to... Okay. Uh, okay, so yeah, these ethical dilemmas are there. What happens is that if you are working with parties, correct, hmm. big parties, so the big parties normally already have their, what hmm. you can call is the dirty trick department sort of, correct? Hmm. 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 Who, who does these things on a daily basis? Hmm. So sometimes what also happens is that we take most of this stuff which is happening on Twitter too seriously, correct? Hmm. That one hashtag is running, then the other party runs another hashtag that has no impact on on, on, on or, or, or very little impact on the public. Hmm. Now, hmm. if there is a serious, let's say, a, a, a fake news a campaign against, let's say, some individual politician you are working with, correct? Hmm. So, so a fake news can always be busted by a fake news only. Hmm. Hmm. There is no other way to do it. Hmm. Hmm. Correct. That's number one. Number hmm. two is in WhatsApp world, in, in a world where there is very little attention span time. Hmm. Sometimes it is also better to just let it be because it dies down within 24 hours. Hmm. 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 Correct. So that depends upon the uh, circumstantial approach. Hmm. Sometimes hmm. you need to uh, bust it. So you have to put another, let's say, plant another fake news to bust it. Or hmm. you just let it be if, if it is not serious, it hmm. it doesn't matter anyways. Because this is largely being fought on not on not on traditional media, correct? This hmm. battle is largely being fought on the digital or the social media, correct? Hmm. Or the WhatsApps or Facebooks hmm. or the Twitters of the world. Correct. Hmm. If there is something which has which is a fake news or which uh, about a political party or a politician in a in a television channel or a newspaper, then we can just or whichever is the client, we can advise them to officially deny it or 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 go uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, and 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 challenge that. Correct. But if it is just going around in social media, WhatsApp, sometimes you you do a diversion. Sometimes you remain silent. Sometimes you just add another fake news to 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 to, to counter it. Hmm. Okay, and if they, just uh, one more question. So, uh, consultants who have to also play the dirty tricks manager are they uh, uh, regarded more in the uh, eyes of the leader and the party, or they are just another? Like, I'm just trying to understand. Like, someone who does fancy regression models and do all the data analysis, how will that person be equated vis-a-vis? -vis, can you go this like let go of this? viral video or create another viral video it is see, it is not about that actually in fact uh, most of the regression models or data models nobody understands correct okay. when even when you take to politicians correct i mean as i said common sense works mm. so maybe in the in, in the background you are doing regression or whatever model you are doing mm. but ultimately when you go and explain to a to a candidate or to a party it it has to be in very simple lay managed terms correct yes. that's number yes. one yes number two is uh, uh and most of the uh, um, uh number two is what you said okay the dirty tricks thing so then i mean every every department has a certain role correct mm -hmm. if as an agency you are offering all these services correct i mean everything 360 mm -hmm. degree then you you may not just be judged by it by one of the specific 
uh, hmm. services which is the dirty tricks or let's say the social media i mean hmm. dirty hmm. tricks is is largely part of the social media hmm. teams hmm. correct well hmm. wherein you 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 uh, create memes etc on almost on a daily basis and and throw it in there in their whatsapp systems which which largely the the party is is managing to distribute so i think we give i think too much importance to these things and these things are not on top of the mind uh, things which uh, are actually troubling the politicians it's largely inputs from the ground hmm. largely inputs from the ga- ground unbiased hmm. unbiased hmm. input from the ground see like we are saying oh the, there is too much of data that also is an issue correct but it's like it's like a chief minister of a state or a, a president of a regional political party gets mm. information from four or five sources mm. correct mm. but mm. ultimately ultimately the decision which he or she takes depends of, is 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 a gut feeling which is mm. backed by some sort of data correct mm. so uh, a part, let's say recommendation mm. of a candidate is 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 one of the tasks which some of the political parties are doing correct mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. the recommendation of candidate is coming from the party party mm-hmm. leadership party cadre is coming from opinion polls surveys is also mm-hmm. coming from qualitative surveys or which we call the political intelligence units of political mm-hmm. consulting firms which largely deals with qualitative aspect surveys or an opinion poll is largely quantitative so they have three or you can say choices from different sources and ultimately it is the gut call of the of the state president or uh, or the cm or the deputy cm or the uh, screening committee which which ultimately takes the call so it's a, it's a it's an added tool or it's an added information which is provided to the political party it also depends upon the strength of the political parties hmm. some political parties may not have that strength hmm. to uh, get names from uh, the ground correct so hmm. in 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 those situations your role perhaps is is uh, bigger hmm. because the party doesn't have a structure and that happens with with a lot of regional parties which are largely um, personality driven however hmm. in a regional party what happens is that i mean prashant kishore or an ipac has largely worked with politi- uh, regional parties after they stint with national parties correct mm-hmm. so after after bjp and then congress in up they they shifted or moved to regional parties if, what happens in regional parties is that if your strategy or idea is liked by the high command it there are high chances of getting it implemented very quickly because the, the party boss does not have to ask anybody correct yeah, yeah, he yeah. or she is the king of the party whoever does not agree they will fi- hire or fire him correct but mm. in bjp congress what happens is that today it's a largely bureaucratic setup so even if you are an abm or a varahi or a inclusive mind the 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 the, the turnaround time of mm-hmm. your suggestions is fairly high because even if you are providing consultancy to say uh, chief minister of a bjp today most of them are not in a position to take any decision correct they have mm-hmm. to get back to the high command so that mm-hmm. is the flexibility which you have in a regional party Parties. your 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 ideas get implemented very quickly if the top family or the boss likes those right. ideas this is a significant difference i have seen while working with both bjp congress and regional parties the decision making is pretty fast thank you amitabh now i'm going to ask each like every one of you like one question and just uh, uh, you know uh, the two questions that i want uh, uh, to have some clarity on and each of one of you can uh, add a bit to it so the first question is since like you know uh, uh, prashant kishore has been coming uh, quite often in our conversation uh and he has of course like you know a uh, very very uh, tall image uh, in, in the world of political consultancy everyone sort of like uh, those who want to become political consultants perhaps idealize uh, him uh, a person who can work with multiple parties at the same time uh, you know like you have a monopoly over the industry in some ways uh, but like he's a anomaly or a unique case in that sense uh someone had asked this question on 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 q and a box and i think it's very interesting uh which is like could these political consultants 
shape policies of a party, uh, especially when they get in power, uh, or could they help in shaping uh, what policies to be prioritized? Could they shape the ideology of a political party? And could they make or remake a leader? And the reason I'm saying like, you know, this is a fictional account, but I, when I teach like in my party's course, I have one uh, week on political consultancy and I want all of them to watch The Best Wing, uh, which is a show set up in United States where, uh, you know, the senior consultant of the previous president actually like to the junior person says, you have to go and find your own president. So the consultant is actually selecting who the presidential candidate is going to be or has to be backed. Uh, so I'm just asking, like, uh, do you all think like uh, consultants have this kind of influence or in future uh, they'll have this influence? Anyone can start, Rim Jim, and you can start and then we can get Amitabh. Um, can you start, if that's okay? Yeah, go ahead. Rim Jim Ji, do you want to go first? In fact, I would like to take the back seat and hear you all first. So please go okay. ahead. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I think, Raul, uh, I think they can share policies. But the thing is that I don't think a lot of the political consultants want to share policy. They might want to get a future. They might have a future political aspiration. That's certainly true of a lot of middle rung employees in these firms. But I think the Prashant Kishore appetite to have that sort of belly to shape the agenda, I think very few of them have. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you do what Prashant Kishore tried to do with, you know, with the Bharati Vikas mission initially with Nitish, which did not go as per plan after the 2015 election, or what was the original intention when I, when um, CAG was set up mm -hmm. uh, to help Modi in 2014. So I think policies, yes, certainly. I think ideology and far more circumspect, circumspect. So, you know, not just in India, more generally around the world, an argument has often been made that with the coming of these consultants, there is what is called the marketization of politics. There is this idea that suddenly ideology stops stops mattering. You're just polling people on every single issue, and you know then you're just going with the winds. Where is leadership anywhere? And I take a strong ex exception to that, both around around the globe, but also in India generally. I think the fact that we're living in what you know, even you in your writing, Rahul, have described as perhaps possibly the rise of a new single party, one party system. Mm -hmm. the, really, the churn of BJP's ideological hegemony has happened at a moment when consultants have been on the ascendant. Mm -hmm. So, you know, correlation is not causation, but the fact that the two have gone hand in hand should surely give us evidence that the rise of this industry does not put a premium on um, on ideology, howsoever one might define it. I think mm -hmm. ideological contestations are here, they're, they're here to stay. And consultants don't reinvent ideologies. What they help politicians to do is to selectively market themselves to certain constituencies in certain strategic ways, but I, I I don't think a consultants has the consultants have the power to reshape ideological programmatic issues in this wholesale manner. Policy is here and there, sure. Uh, Rimjim, you want to come in, or should I get in? Uh... Uh, I would love to kind yeah. of you know uh, jump in quickly. So uh, when we talk about the policy bit of things, uh, most of the consultants, barring a few who are like basically in a kind of a role where they can speak about it, are uh, they understand the demarcation between a political party and the government very well. So because this question keeps coming in our orientation all the time. So when we are, for example, working for a campaign, the conversation between a political party as a government and the same party during elections are two very different questions. But yes, if uh, they have been able to make a certain amount of change, uh, I have, uh, I know a lot of people, uh, like there are many political uh, consultancies who have gone ahead and helped with, uh, say, you know, management, managing the policy bit of things. And in fact, any political consultant who has served basically uh, in a certain capacity, uh, in, in in a political party does have an aspiration to try out the policy bit of things because uh, uh, it's a fine line at the end of the day. So that aspiration is there in uh, most of the political consultants, in fact. Uh, in fact, I've seen more political consultants to try that route rather than the political ambition. However, how many of them actually get to make a change over there, that's a very big question. So even if when we say that, yes, the changes have been made, it's just, you know, quite a few people, handful of people who have been able to penetrate, penetrate through and successfully get into it. So that's one bit of thing. Secondly, ideology. I think ideological change uh, is very difficult that way because that's the core thing that defines a political party. So mm. the best 
uh, I would say political consultant can do is to uh, kind of uh, message it out in a way. Yes, that's optimized. Yeah, to your uh, basically need. Uh, mm. that let's not maybe if we are like let's make it more i would say mellow it down a little or maybe you know uh, wrap it around a certain issue so on and so forth or, or maybe make it more edgy if needed but uh, more than that most of the times uh, they do know that they have to stick to a certain kind of ideology because there has been cases there have been cases where political consultants have tried bringing in very uh, contrary opinions and uh, it hasn't gone down well in longer term for them so Okay. Uh, Amitabh and Ajit, let me add to uh, uh, what I was asking uh, uh, to Ajit and uh, not Ajit, Amog and Rinjim, which is like, uh, since uh, uh, Amitabh, you mentioned this term multiple times, common sense, what I see happening and, uh, 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 you know, in last 10 years, that most political parties now make sort of like lots of welfare promises. Uh, right. And this, to my mind, is also coincides with the rise of political consultancy. Uh, is it that like uh, the advice that you give to uh, uh, these sort of like big leaders uh, whom you meet that, sir, offer these three things and you will get votes of these segments? Right. And so what seems to be happening that leaders are not investing in building parties on the ground or building. They might not be interested uh, uh, for different other reasons. But would you say that uh, the rise of political consultancy in some ways uh, is linked to rise of welfare populism uh, in politics. Uh, Amitabh and then Ajit. I, I wouldn't say that actually. See, okay. because let's say political parties like a BJP or a Congress, I don't think that their manifesto promises or policies are being driven by political consultants. We give too much importance to political consultancy mm -hmm. if that's the case. Mm -hmm. They they already have think tanks in place. Mm -hmm. Both BJP and Congress have many organizations who work as their think tanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, welfareism or welfareism as a as a policy. Mm -hmm. uh, one is to counter, let's say, the the sort of the welfareism or the uh, freebies, I mean, for the lack of a better word, it's, it's mm -hmm. not freebie, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 um, things started by, let's say, the Aam Party and they getting traction mm -hmm. in uh, in uh, Delhi and, and then later in Punjab. Huh. Mm -hmm. But in, in case of regional parties, what happens is that regional... When a political consultancy firm works with a regional party, the regional party also expects that since you have worked with uh, political parties and individuals on a pan-India level, mm. then you bring to the table your best learning or best practices from across India and the world. Correct. Mm. So that is the time when people like us do uh, 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 suggest these, uh, let's say, welfare welfareism policies or these schemes mm. to the regional parties because we see that, I mean, some of them, some of us see that these things have worked for uh, uh, a political party or a B political party in mm. the past. So mm. I see it like that. And when we talk about policies, see, I think most political consultants are involved in drafting the manifesto promises. Mm -hmm. or at least giving some suggestions to the manifesto promises, more so in regional parties to a lesser extent in, in national parties through through various campaigns. Mm -hmm. However, when the political, the, the, the application of this policy or scheme would happen only if the political party wins. But mm -hmm. whenever a political party wins, there is already a system, mm -hmm. a bureaucratic system or a system of bureaucracy IAS officers, etc., which actually do this thing, mm. which is implementation of schemes and policies. And that is why we have had issues in the past with mm. political consultancies and the existing system on who should be implementing these policies. Correct. Because that is when the, 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 uh, you can say, Takkar Shuru Ho Jata Hai. Correct. And that is why then perhaps uh, hmm. IPAC left the BJP and then again they had to leave uh, JDU but they have stuck with uh, YSRCP 
they mm -hmm. they have been consistently doing this for mm -hmm. uh, the last five years or so so sometimes it it works sometimes it's, it doesn't work but it doesn't work primarily because there is already a system which uh, they are in place to take care of the policy implementation correct and mm -hmm. we are rather rather more in the role of uh, advising or, or or drafting of policies or or manifesto policies thank you amitabh uh Ajit, you have uh, things to add on to this. Yeah, yeah. I have a few comments or two, three points that we discussed. Please, please go ahead. First of all, of course, the immediate question on uh, whether consult, uh, the presence of consultancy increases welfare uh, measures. Hmm. Uh, and that I I mean, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know in terms of the quantum, but certainly the varieties of, in the variety of ideas that we see, right? Probably, you know, political consultants coming in try to bring in new ideas of uh, welfare measures, right? So rather than giving uh, a cash uh, scheme, right? So you have a whole lot of different schemes, including, you know, Kisan scheme, the uh, Lakhpati Didi scheme, the whole lot of different ideas about how do you implement welfareism. And some of those ideas may have their roots uh, uh, in, in what uh, political consultants uh, have kind of uh, suggested. So that is uh, no, that is one aspect of that. Uh, but uh, I, I have another uh, few, uh, you know, aspects with regarding some of the other points that were uh, this thing. And, uh, you know, with regard to one is about the morals of, uh, you know, do political consultants, should they follow, follow a certain uh, moral or a, or a value framework? And uh, while, you know, I'm broadly... Uh, you know, uh, supportive of the work that the contributions that political consultants make in terms of bringing uh, new ideas and things like that, right? But I still feel that, you know, uh, political consultants claim that they are there to professionalize parties, to make, uh, you know, the functioning of parties more professional. But are political consultants professional themselves? Right? And what do you mean by professionalization of political consultancy as a profession? Right. So do you have, you know, particular, uh, you know, uh, associations, right, where political consultants get together, define what their collective value should be, what their norms should be. Right. And there's regular knowledge sharing of political consultants. I mean, this is a great fora where uh, some of us are getting together, but I think this should be happening more uh, often within the political consultants. And that kinds of sets up certain values that, uh, you know, they can follow and uh, whether we need some kind of a regulatory framework uh, to, uh, I think these are important kind of policy considerations that I would like. The second is you talked about uh, the relationship between political workers and uh, political consultants. And this also kind of, uh, you know, draws from uh, you know, uh, one of your points that, uh, you know, do welfare means uh, then reduce party organization. Uh, in fact, I would argue that probably welfare means would strengthen party organization. And the reason I'm saying that is if you introduce welfare means, you are now very particular to, ta to find out who has benefited from that or not. And since you're trying to gain, uh, and increasingly parties are trying to gain electoral mileage from their beneficiaries, you need a strong party organization to find out and to help people who have not received those benefits, right? But uh, my final point, and of course, I would like to hear a lot more from the other panelists, is that uh, it's uh, one should look at political workers and pol policy and political consultants as way of you know replacing one another uh, my sense that each of them have their particular a particular space in a political party and if i'm uh, being very a little bit simplistic about it but i'm hoping that i can uh, give the broader sense that a political worker is the heart of the party right they are the ones who really com uh, communicate the emotions of the political ideology they are invested in the political ideology and no amount of logical thinking uh, will have limited effect when a neighbor of yours comes in and, and tells you that, you know, I have received this benefit and this is great and you'll receive it tomorrow. Right. So political workers are the heart of uh, and uh, the political consultant contributes to the mind of the party 
They contribute to strategizing the party. And I see that both of them have important distinctive uh, uh, kind of roles. Yeah, so thank you. Raul, quickly love to chip in because uh, what Ajit yeah. mentioned, right? So we have sometimes, of course, seen examples where political party or, or the government basically had to execute various schemes at such a big magnitude that they had to use the political workers, basically. That mm -hmm. was seen during the vaccination drive. So uh, every booth worker of uh, the, the, of course, central government, every booth worker of BJP was given the target of vac vaccinating 50 people from their own basically polling station and the entire machinery came together to deliver on what we now call the world's biggest uh, I would say uh, vaccination drive. So that happens in very far and few cases where the urgency and the magnitude is uh, supposed to be delivered in a stipulated amount of time but yes uh, how much how often that is that's of course a question to explore. Okay, so my last question, thank you. Uh, you all have been uh, really wonderful. Last question, which I think should interest all four of our, five uh, of us, is especially since there are a lot of people in the audience who are young and may want to join political consultancy, uh, which is uh, uh, to Ajit and uh, to Amog uh, as uh, political science teachers, like should political consultancy be taught in political science department and what kind of courses uh, you would imagine? Uh, is it being taught uh, in, in UK, uh, Amog, or uh, management schools would be interested in this? And then to Rimjim and Amitabh, like, uh, would you hire graduates who have done courses in uh, political consultancy? And what kind of uh, skills you are looking from uh, uh, those uh, students who have gone through such a course? Do you, do you want to go? Yeah, you, we go? Can, you can start. Okay, I'll, I'll keep my answer very short. I think in yeah, the UK, so increasingly there are departments which offer degrees in campaign management, political communication management. In India, I, I think it's only a matter of time before that increases. Mm -hmm. The only thing I'll say is that I think social scientists, I'll fly the flag of social scientists dominating this field. When the industry started out, you had, you had boys from IIT Kanpur, right, mm -hmm. who are leading the... Uh, the industry forward. I think somewhere along the line, there was a pivot and far more social scientists and humanities folks have come in. When I've spoken to political consultants, they tell me that they value those soft skills that, you know, political science degree will offer you rather than a data science degree. So okay. I'll fly, I'll fly that flag, flag high and say, social scientists need to, uh, you know, go ahead and forge ahead in the field. Okay. Ajit? Yeah. So I, I would broadly resonate with that. And I mean, I would say that we need lots, of, uh, we need courses. Because uh, at the end of the day, what we recognize is political consultants are taking important decisions that mm. could affect uh, the public good. So I think we should have a prop, uh, you know, more organized, systematic kind of programs in those directions and try to fill the gaps. Right. Of course, a lot of my students over here come from a management background. So I, I kind of see the reverse side of what Amog is seeing. Right. Mm. That I feel that, you know, people from a management background and when they're getting recruited in some of these, uh, you know, firms, they need a social science kind of, a uh, you know, uh, a, a decent course in social science to give them the other side of, of you. And uh, Amitabh has just pointed out, yes, there is a there is a, a, a need for a systematic uh, kind of education. Okay. Uh, uh, Rimjim and Amitabh, what kind of skill set uh, you would be looking from these graduates? So, of course, uh, if you know, there's a formalized faculty for that. It, of course, takes away a lot of handholding that we have to do during the, I would say, initial phase. That is kind of uh, getting up to, you know, uh, help them uh, ask the right questions, maybe uh, teach them how to profile a constituency or how to understand party structures. Mm -hmm. It saves a lot of time over there. And of course, political uh, scientists or, you know, people coming from uh, the background of political sciences are, of course, our top choices at this point however one thing that I would like to point out is that uh, they really one thing that uh, they really lack is the operational I would say sense of things and uh, uh, we always keep forgetting that a lot of political uh, consultation is about logistical and operational operations on the ground not theories 
exactly exactly so i think that's one thing i would really really love to see that okay i understand people understand structures but they should also know how to execute what are the things to keep in mind how those structures work how the cap- scientists are worst at executing things <laughs> you know, like we live in now yeah, amitabh uh, since you dabble in the world of uh, financial uh, services as well as in political strategy what would you recommend see essentially it is soft skills as 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 most of people have said and uh, the biggest soft skill for me is is passion if you are not passionate about politics and elections people would not succeed in this field mm-hmm. that's number one because it's a very different kind of a field it has fairly long hours there are no saturdays sundays mm-hmm. you have to work around the clock mm-hmm. that's of a that sort of a mindset you need to have correct because mm-hmm. i come from a banking background and mm-hmm. having made this 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 change i i realized this that this is a 24 into 7 into 365 kind of a thing because the politician is working mm. all the days of the year so you have to correct you can't yes, yes. take a break or end day that's number one number two is i think good communication skills and when i say that good writing skills yeah. because a lot of reports are getting generated and submitted to the top leadership mm. wherein you have to have very good writing skills to really communicate what you intend to see in fairly simple lay managed language mm-hmm. even for the data reports we we put out correct i mean yeah. the data guys will give regression and this and that what you said i mean and i'm not taking away the credit but what is the gist of that story mm-hmm. what what does it say that is fairly lacking in most of the data analysts which we have had or or i have had experience of correct mm-hmm. so soft skills largely telling a story better communication writing skills and passion for this field is is what will take you far great thank you amitabh uh, uh, so those uh, who have passion for politics uh, can think of the world of political consultancy especially the younger ones who have joined us today thank you everyone uh, for joining us this was a fascinating conversation ajit amogh rimjim and amitabh thank you so much uh, we'll thank see thank you so much thank you and uh, i think on thursday or friday we are going to have another session on voting calculus and how much economy plays a role so please do join us i think those who have subscribed to cpr email you might have got the invitation already so again thank you so much good evening see you soon bye bye